morning. So delighted to have have this talk. Although before we get into the um, you know the impressive credentials and the introduction, I was just going to say two things. Um, one is to say, sort of in the order of interesting talks. For sorry, I'm just calling out my notes. Interesting talks to folks like us. Um, I got a hot tip today that Sam Ellenport, the book conservator, he will be giving a talk at the Cambridge Public Library on Wednesday, May 11th at seven. It's going to be in person at the main branch of the Cambridge Library, the one that's on Broadway, which as if you guys haven't been, people haven't been to that branch yet, it's beautiful. Um, I know it's not that new, but two years have been removed <laughs> from our recent history. Anyway, the talk is open to the public and Sam thought quite rightly, I think that some uh, Society of Printer, Printers members might be interested in other people in our audience tonight. So I will um, put the info in the chat, but the name of the talk is The Beauty of Bookbinding and Decoration, Linked Spine Bindings. Uh, again, that will be Wednesday, May 11th at seven, and I'll, I'll put that info up. Um, the other little thing I was gonna say is that, this is really to any members who are here, um, in the next day or two, I'll have a, an email sent out with a very, what will probably be a very brief special meeting of the members. We we're going to we're going to ratify our recent vote on the proposal to amend our constitution, so that we can open up um, eligibility for members who would like to serve on the council to people who live uh, a little farther afield than we used to have. So uh, you'll get a link to that soon, and then we hopefully we can um, start talking about uh, our next slate of council members. Okay, so now back to the much more interesting part of the evening. Uh, delighted to be now on talk two of our three speaker series that Whitney has brilliantly helped us set up. Um, and I'm gonna have to actually have the introductions given by Whitney, um, but I will also just say a quick thing. This is the second and the third one next month will be, for those who haven't heard, it's not gonna be at the BPL as it usually is. It will be at Mass Art. That will be our talk by Alison Bechdel. You'll also hear about that soon. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, tonight, Whitney, please take it away. And then sure. you Hi, everybody. Whitney Leader Patone. If you don't know me, I'm one of the council members for the Society of Printers, and I'm very excited to introduce Liz Francis and Bishak Som. Um, they've collaborated on a wonderful book called Spellbound that came out in 2020 um, and is a memoir. Um, a graphic memoir. Um, Liz is the founder and publisher of Street Noise Books, which was is a new publishing company that she founded all by herself, with the focus on heavily illustrated um, nonfiction and graphic novels. Um, she says the books have a radical intersectional feminist, queer and inclusive vision, which is basically like the best thing in the world to me. Um, and they, uh, these books are um, all by people with marginalized voices, which I think is a niche that really needs filling. And I'm so glad that Liz created this publishing company just to do that. Before that, Liz was an art director and designer in some of the major publishers in New York, um, which is how we met at a conference for nonfiction. Um, Vishak is an Indian American trans femme artist and author. Um, of course, Spellbound, which she'll discuss tonight, um, is critically acclaimed and was a 2021 Lambda Literary Award finalist. Um, another one of her books, Asara Engine, was um, a winner of a 2021 LA Times Book Prize and uh, for Best Graphic Novel and the 2021 Lambda Literary Award winner for Best LGBT DQ comics. So this is going to be really exciting and I'm so excited for you all to hear how they've collaborated to make this wonderful and amazing book. And if you haven't read it, go find your local indie and buy it because it's really fantastic. So welcome. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Whitney. And thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Society of Printers. We're just thrilled. Bishak and I are we decided to be in Bishak's studio tonight instead of being in separate 
yeah. little Zoom windows because we were sort of... Because we crazy like that. Yeah. <laughs> we just decided that would be much more fun and much more collaborative since yeah. it's all about collaboration mm -hmm. tonight. Um, so I think what we want to do is uh, get started by jumping right in and having Bishak read to you um, a section of her graphic novel so that you'll have a sense of it and then we can start the discussion. Okay, that sounds great. I'm going to share my screen and uh, do a little, can everyone see that? Yes. Yeah. All right, yeah. super. Um, so this, sorry, hang on one second. So this will be just a short excerpt from um, Spellbound. Uh, I guess I won't introduce it because it'll be fairly obvious, but you'll get a sense of how certain modes within the book uh, transition from one to another. So this is one chapter called Dust Bunnies. A2, luckily I'd been doing thumbnails of this latest story on weekends and evenings while I was still at Chad's office, which means I can dive right into penciling. I'll explain later what, what the context is of all this, but you'll get a sense of it from just the excerpt. It's been so long since I sat down to work on art and, or comics, and this time I'm gambling that a concerted effort will result in a momentous life shift. It's still a little early to feel like a fraud, but I'm sure that will come soon enough. I've got one more page penciled by 3 p.m. and decide to take a well-deserved cleaning break, seeing as so much stuff has accumulated around my desk. This, <laughs> mingling with dust bunnies, ampersand fur, and orphan lentils. As I'm putting away old files and photo albums away, I come across the very first snapshot of me when I came home from the hospital. Early years. I was born in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. My family moved there from India several years before as my dad's job had been ended. Dad was a statistician. He worked for the United Nations Population Division and wrote two books on demographics, which are to this day still Greek to me, uh, Mom worked part-time with the United Nations Women's Guild. We lived in an apartment block across the road from Haile Selassie, Emperor of Ethiopia and Rastafarian Messiah. My sister Subrata, who's 10 years older than I am, went to an English school in Addis. We were brought up by two Ethiopian nannies, Heli and Segi. I remember only fragments from our time in Ethiopia, riding go-karts with my sister, the taste of injera, Dusty Springfield and Nana Muscuri on the stereo, the sweet smell of Segi. I attended an English kindergarten. Subrata was sent off to boarding school in England when she was 12. My folks told me I spoke Amharic as a toddler, but I only remember a couple of words now. Leba, which means thief, and Thinish Thinish, which means little. Subrata came back to Addis Ababa during her school holidays. We'd play cardboard records cut out of the back box of cereal boxes, build Lego houses, with the octopuses, and read comics. When I was six, revolution broke out in Ethiopia, which forced the UN to resettle us in New York. I don't remember that move, but it must have been pretty momentous for my parents. For the first month or so, we lived in the Roger Smith Hotel on East 47th Street, subsisting on Asian fried chicken takeaway dinners. Good evening, young miss. How are you finding our fair city? Eventually, we found an apartment in Waterside, a strange complex of four towers clad in red brick atop an elevated plaza overlooking the East River. You like the view, Betty? My parents enrolled me at the United Nations International School, which was, conveniently enough, about 50 feet from Waterside, which meant in later years that I could stumble out of bed 15 minutes before classes started and still be on time. I was put into a bilingual program for some reason. Half our classes were in French, half in English. Mon chat est noir et blanc et il aime faire des bandes dessinées. Ah, mais c'est impossible, Angélie. Enfin, les chats ne savent pas dessiner. My classmates were from all over the world, Germany, Ghana, Guyana, Guatemala. My best friend in first grade was Yuko, who told me she housed a secret rocket in her basement that her dad would commandeer to the moon on weekends. And you can be Colonel Steve. Why do you always get to be Wonder Woman? I loved the taste of her mom's nori rolls. In second grade, I made friends with a small gang of girls, Gregoria, Kaya, and Francesca. Somewhat organically, we began drawing comics on 11 by 14 newsprint. We invented a crew of bizarre characters, a sneezy nose with arms and legs, a woman with a bottom for a head. 
We'd often have sleepovers at each other's houses. One time at Francesca's palatial digs on the Upper East Side, we stole into her parents' bedroom where from a chest of drawers, she dug out from a tiny velvet lined box, one of her mom's glass eyes. In fifth grade, we were hanging out on Francesca's bunk bed when she revealed to me the mysteries of the joy of sex. I remember lovingly rendered drawings of very hairy men. Whoa, what are they doing with that rubber band? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> At birthday parties, we'd play past the parcel and dance to the hits of the day. Sean Cassidy, Sister Sledge, the Sugar Hill Gang. Sixth grade meant moving up to the fourth floor of the school. We were all very impressed with the chemistry labs and such. Whoa, that's some serious shit. Oh my God, stop swearing. Once a year, our class would be taken off to New Jersey for camping excursions. There was bug juice, tr trust building games, apple cobbler, sitting with some of the cool boys during lunch. I haven't shat in days. French class got more intense. Our new teacher, Madame Cuvelier, had framing light flaming red hair in an assertive manner. We called her the dragon lady. She petrified us mightily, but I wanted to be like her, bold, confident, sexy. Et alors, cette pièce de Molière, qu'en penses-tu, Anjali? Bum, enfin, c'est-à-dire. I had taken up the clarinet under the impression that playing jazz was cool. Little did I know that we'd end up playing things like Ebony and Ivory and the theme from Rocky in Woodwind Ensemble instead. Come on, flutes, Allegro, get it together. I continued to make comics under the tutelage of Dorothy, who was a year older than I was and took me under her wing. She used rapidographs for inking. I was still stuck at the penciling stage and zip a tone, look it up, for shading. Whoa, this is like so professional. Just stick with me, kid. In chemistry class, while the other kids were busy with experiments, I'd watch Madame Cuvelier teach French in the classroom across the way. Hey, are you going to help with this titration or just go up at her all day? I was a pretty shy, dweeby, introverted kid. I exhibited none of the bad behavior that seemed to be mandatory to a high school experience. My pals and I would hang out after school, drinking Cokes and snacking on gummy bears and lick -a The other kids would smoke, drink, pair off, make out. Our nerdiness exempted us from those particular practices. In the evenings, we chat on the phone for hours about homework, computer games, the best strategies for running, the dreaded mile in gym class. My friend Harisita's suggestion, just run as fast as you can the whole way, which I did, only to throw up at the end of it. In French class, Madame Cuvelier had started to single me out. She lavished praise on me continuously. I would visit her in the modern languages department after school. I'd sit there on the floor just below the fog of cigarette smoke and gift her with records. Ah, the jam. Merci, Angélie. T'es vraiment gentille. I made a crew of new friends, and together we started to get into scary music. Joy Division, Bauhaus, Susie and the Banshees. I began wearing Dr. Martin's boots and oversized fuzzy pullovers. We would go to CBGBs to see ska and hardcore bands. I was starting to feel a little less dweeby, a little more dangerous. After classes, we'd head off to St. Mark's Place to buy records, t-shirts, and badges, culminating in a pilgrimage to Bleaker Bob's record store in the West Village with its notoriously surly owner, Alvin Hovering, up loud. What are you looking for? Punk? New wave? Gothic? Huh? <laughs> I am just browsing. Dad seemed to enjoy his work at the UN. He was always traveling off to a new destination every few months. Tashkent, Ankara, Geneva, Belgrade. Mom had started doing a master's at teacher's college at Columbia and occasionally subbing at my school. Being proper Bengalis, my folks were obsessed with fish, and the best fish markets were in Chinatown, where dad would take me on weekends. The Chinese fishmongers even got to know him and even picked up a few Bengali phrases from him. Hello, sir. Apni gamonachin. Hello, Atsi. Thank you. Twice a year, we'd go out to New Jersey or Long Island for Durga Puja and Kali Puja, annual, annual festivals honoring fierce Hindu goddesses. Every couple of months, we'd visit my aunt out on Long Island. These were sleepy affairs, the highlight of which was preparing dinner, rice, dal, fried okra, neem leaves, vegetable curry, and of course the revered and much discussed fish entree. Can't they see these excursions into suburbia are killing me? My attitude in those days was spectacularly obnoxious. In 11th grade, Madame Cuvelier invited me over to her apartment on the pretext of returning her dissertation, which she'd let me over the summer. 
She answered the door in a nightgown, shooed her kids away and made us a pot of tea. We chatted for a good while en français about jazz, socialism, my plans for college. Ah, te voilà, Angélie, entre, je t'en prie. I left trembling. At the advanced age of 18, I kissed a boy for the first time. Timo, a tall German kid who used to date Bergatha, the middle chick in our grade. What he saw in the likes of me was unclear. He tasted of cigarettes, which seemed very sexy to me at the time. One time in art class, Francis, who I'd known since second grade, told me, Timo says you're an excellent kisser. For my final project in art, I drew a short comic, something about disaffected youth in a record store, and did two paintings that riffed on that comic. I thought I was getting pretty good at art and that I could go on to study fine arts in college. It's looking so nice on you. Aw, thanks, Ma. My folks urged me to follow my bourgeois Bengali calling and become a doctor instead. I applied to and got into Cornell to study biology. I wasn't at all enthusiastic about this, but I thought I didn't really have a choice. You can do art in your spare time, Anju. Graduation day was a bit of a whirlwind. The ceremony took place in the General Assembly Hall at the United Nations. Ragatha showed up in a formal gown and everyone applauded. There was a party afterward at some hole in the wall in the East Village and everyone was drunk. Timo broke up with me that day. But I kissed two other boys and Harasita that night. In August that year, my aunt and my mom drove me up to Ithaca in a rented station wagon. I sat in the back with all my boxes of clothes and records and read a letter that my friend Nishama, who I'd known since we were seven, had written me. It's a scary world out there, princess, but I know you and I know we can do this. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, I'll, sh I'll share the, the main presentation. Um, okay. I don't want to give away the ending here. <laughs> um, there we go. All right. Take it away, Liz. Okay. Thank you, Bashak, for, um, can you see, can they see the screen? It should be coming up in a second. Okay. Yeah. For reading that section <laughs> of, um, of Spellbound, which I have right here. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. Just to give you all a little background, um, Street Noise launched in, um, as a, well, we're a small indie publishing company and we have a focus of nonfiction, heavily illustrated or graphic novels. Um, and as Whitney said, uh, we have a mission to provide a platform for the voices of marginalized people. And um, I'm going to go to the next yes. slide. Um, when I, part of why I started Street Noise was to publish things that the big publishers were not publishing for whatever reason, um, and were sometimes scared to publish. Um, which is what sometimes brought me to people like Bashak. And sometimes it's not necessarily that uh, that their books, their books might not have been at a stage yet where a big publisher would be ready to accept them. So sometimes that's sort of how we came up with the concept of this talk is that it took some collaboration mm -hmm. to make this book um, happen. Um, we, yep. We have 10 books published already. We've been, um, been out in the world less than two years, and I'm quite proud of this lineup of books. Um, we have uh, four of which, four of these books have received starred trade reviews. Two have been featured in the New York Times book review, including Spellbound. Um, and one of which was chosen as a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize. I felt like I was, uh, it was a little bit like Sophie's Choice when, <laughs> when Come Home Indio um, was up for uh, the best graphic novel in, by the LA Times Book Prize against Bishak's other book, Apsara Engine. <laughs> and so I, I couldn't be sad when Shock one for Upsara Engine. Yay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so that's just a little background. We're based in Brooklyn. Um, 
Most of the books are graphic novels. The only one here that we've done so far that isn't a graphic novel is Stupid Black Girl. That's a collection of essays, but it has um, 20 pieces of art um, as that were done in response to the essays. So all of the books, because I come from a background of art direction, I really wanted to have books that were very art driven. Um, and I personally um, think that the graphic novel is, a, is an amazing genre and um, that it has the ability to share people's truth in a very unique way. Um, I wanted to be a part of helping people share their truths with the world. I felt like at the time when I started Street Noise, it was really in response to the presidential election um, of 2016. And um, I really, I felt that what the world needed was for more people to have a place to tell their truth. Um, and there's a, there is a unique way that it, it's then told when people are not only writing their own stories, but drawing them as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to do a little spiel about the process of, of how, um, well, I'm not going to do it. We're both going to do it. So <laughs> feel free to jump in anytime you want, but sure. I'll just lead the way a bit into um, how Spellbound became, came into being. Um, so a little bit of context, I guess. Um, I I used I trained as an architect, um, and I worked for in the field for a long time. Um, and it, as you if you read the book, you'll find out exactly what happened uh, to make me not become an architect. But needless to say, um, it sort of came to a, a boil at some point in my life around 2012, and I quit my job in architecture to focus on art and comics, um, and I took a year off to work on my first book, Apsara Engine. Uh, and after having sent that off to potential publishers, uh, I kind of didn't know what to do with myself. I needed, like, I didn't know what to do with the sort of creative energy that I had. It was felt like sort of postpartum, you know, feelings. Um, so I started drawing diary comics, which is not a genre that I ever thought I would really get into, but I, I've been reading some uh, stuff that other people were doing in, the, in, the, in, the, in that field. And I thought I would give it a go, right? Um, this is the very first instance of what eventually became Spellbound. Um, it has not much to do with my life, except, you know, there's a cat and there, there's lots of wine drinking um, and the sort of, uh, you know, focus on lunches and stuff. But it, this is the first time this character, Anjali, shows up. And um, I think she just stuck and eventually became um, a sort of substitute or an ambassador for me. So when I started drawing uh, subsequent chapters or in, um, episodes of that comic, she took on a fuller role as my uh, as my substitute. So when the, when the comics became much more self-referential and about my life, she took on, she took the place of me. Um, I wasn't out as trans at the time. Um, so, and I'd been, always been writing stories about, you know, in which the main character is a cisgendered woman, whether queer or not, because I didn't think I had access to trans voices at the time. Um, having Anjali as a substitute felt to me very organic and natural. And uh, I guess we'll, you know, in, in retrospect, I think it got a lot more complicated. Um, so she, this is the first chapter of the book in which she comes home and announces to her cat that she's quit her job. Um, and the whole book sort of goes from there uh, to, to explore how she becomes an artist and how she rediscovers herself in that process. And it also goes back to some degree about to in investigating her life, but we'll get into that in a little bit. And while, while we are on this slide, mm -hmm. you should see that um, Ishak did all the hand lettering herself yeah. throughout the whole book. Mm -hmm. And so when we changed things, when, we, <laughs> when the editor and I um, made little suggestions of changing language or adding punctuation or whatever, she had to go in and change it herself. Um, that's something that we don't do very often. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, with our graphic novels, we try to use a font or 
one very popular way of dealing with it right now is that people make fonts of their own handwriting. The artist makes a font of their own handwriting. I think you which did is, that with Apsara Engine, Yeah, right? that's exactly what happened yeah. in Apsara. Which is a nice way um, to get that still that hand-drawn feeling, but have it be authentic and unique to that artist. The only thing, and I'll speak to you all as, uh, I assume, designers, um, as a, with my respect for fonts and uh, typography, um, I, you know, I, I do regret that when you make a font of your own handwriting, it doesn't have necessarily have all that beautiful kerning and all the, you know, the things that go into a, a finely made beautiful um, uh, typeface, but it, it, it's the best we can do. And I, hand lettering, I think is absolutely gorgeous. Like what Bashak did. I, I'm, I was lucky that there, the edits weren't like, um, giant sort of excavations or surgery. <laughs> That's true. Um, so I didn't have to do that much work, but um, it, in the end, it wasn't, it wasn't that like, it wasn't a big deal for me to do the edits by hand. Um, so just in terms of process, you can see here, I, um, I do most of the, I do pencils and lettering and stuff. Um, and then I do, uh, you can see here, I, I ink the artwork and the letters um, these are some of the tools I use, but then I do the colors digitally, which is kind of the first time I tried doing that. And I was really enjoying working on, um, on that as an experiment and a little project. Um, you know, I, I never, I didn't go the whole hog in like, in terms of shading and tones and highlighting things. So it's, they're pretty flat colors, but that's the kind of, um, I don't know. I, I like that. Uh, that. Those are the kinds of comics that I grew up with, at least that I was trying to emulate a little bit. Um, I was just going to show you, this is, this is the room mm -hmm. we're in now. Uh, this is my little studio in Brooklyn. Um, some of the tool, the old fashioned tools that I use to make these comics, well, besides the tablet, but, you know, ink, uh, T-squares, pencils, pens, brushes, um, and then, you know, there's sort of a happy dance between technology and and analog uh, materials and tools. Um, I guess at some point, I the what I started as a diary comic became more like an exercise and in, in therapy for me because I was I wanted to just keep drawing while not having the graphic novel in mind as a project, and I just started like making these episodes about my life. Um, as a freelance architect and as an aspiring graphic novelist. Um, I'm, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do with these. Uh, I had a notion, I think, that there were, was gonna be a web comic. So I, I called it, um, you know, version 1.0 of Spellbound was called The Continuing Adventures of Anjali and Ampersand. Maybe we can talk a little bit later about renaming it. Uh, but this is what it looked like. I thought it would be like sort of you know, I published one a week online, but I was I wasn't really feeling it at all. Um, in the meantime, I I was working on some other projects, um, some other I was contributing to some other uh, comics anthologies, and Anjali started showing up in some of those. This is a um, giant book, which is an homage to Windsor McKay, who did a strip a uh, uh, hundred years ago plus maybe um, called Little Little Nemo in Slumber, Slumberland. So this is um, a whole bunch of comics artists doing homages to him and mine in which uh, the character of me or Anjali takes a walk through this sort of Asher-esque space, which turns out to be her thesis project from uh, architecture school. And it, she eventually wakes up from this nightmare, uh, which I still haven't managed to do. Um, when I met Liz, this uh, though, and I, I think we talked about what I was working on. And um, I told her that I had these diary comics that um, was sort of, you know, the, the thing that seemed more most fitting to Liz's project. Um, and I guess we just started working on it um, from that initial conversation. Um, and you, you well, know, I, I remember that um, I loved Bishak's art and um, 
her, I was getting to know her a little bit as a person and I thought her story was really interesting and the concept mm -hmm. of these diary comics um, chronicling the process of being an, a cartoonist and leaving your, you know, your sort of mainstream job to, to pursue this, this uh, passion that you have. I felt like that would really resonate with a lot of people. And, um, but I also felt like her life story was really fascinating, all the places she'd lived and, and her, her family. And um, we also liked a lot of the same music. But, <laughs> um, and I wondered if this could be, I wanted it to be able to be a book. Um, that was sort of my, that's often my feeling about when I, when I love, because I always come to my books first from the art because I'm an, an art director at heart. So I, if I like someone's art, then I sort of see, do they have a story mm -hmm. that, that could be compelling? And then when that happens, then I try to figure out how we could make it work. And so, um, but I remember, I remember you saying that it is nonfiction, but, mm -hmm. you know, there were all these sort of caveats because there's this stand-in character but then as you explained it to me the importance of that stand-in character for you I thought well that has an even greater mm -hmm. significance and then I was even more intrigued but and also by this time when I had met Liz I had come out as trans so we both kind of um, were processing together the fact of this substitution of the substitute character and what that meant and like how I, I still hadn't processed it because I didn't think this would turn into a book but I think together we sort of hashed it out and we're trying to think of how this could be more than just a well uh, for lack of a better way to put it a straight up memoir but it started to get a little more layered and complex at that time yep you know yep and I felt really strongly that it should have I mean there are books that have been published that are straight not straight that are, <laughs> that are uh diary comics yeah. a collection of diary yeah. comics but i really wanted i felt like this book had a lot more power if it could be um crafted in to tell the narrative story mm -hmm. that bishak wanted to tell you know instead of it being fragments if we could weave it together and so this is um this is a document that we shared with each other in which I proposed an outline for the book with the material that I had at hand, which was mostly like sort of quotidian reflections on being an artist and so on and so forth. Um, but you can see the, uh, I think the, yeah, the highlighted lines are the, are things I would propose that I would add to that. Um, and I or, added the pink. <laughs> I I'm not even sure. But, but you came back to me saying we don't need so much quotidian stuff. Can we have some more um, backstory? Can we have like flesh out who you are as a person? Um, and then, of course, the, I think the most pivotal part uh, was was Liz's idea for having an intro and outro to the book in which. Did I think? Did yeah, you, I think I think when we were when we one of our first meetings, mm -hmm. we said, "How can this work?" And I I I felt that we needed to be honest with the reader mm -hmm. that we needed to sort of set the stage, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's when I wrote, um, sort of framing the, the the sort of meat of the book, where these was an intro and outro in which I appear as myself talking about the book and why I chose to have a substitute character. So it all gets a bit meta, but it also explains the conceit of the book. And it, as you're saying, it, you're, you know, we ended up doing this to be honest with the readers about, about the sort of layers and levels of the book, right? Which also, I think, allows the reader to come on the journey with you. Yeah. Um, instead of having the reader be sort of lost or wondering um you bring the reader into your uh consciousness yeah. and take them on your journey with you so i these are examples of the more what i call quotidian diary comics in which i'm outlining like what it's like on a daily basis like each page is basically a day 
um, of my life as I'm trying to um, forge my path as an artist, right? And so there's like just sort of minute observations of random things in my life that happen, um, you know, distractions, uh, how I try to keep myself at my drawing board and get distracted by my cat and all this sort of thing. Um, but then with, with at Liz's urging, I also went back into my past and these are like, I already read um, some of the, you know, very early, the stuff that reflects on my very early childhood. I also did a chapter. I think the longest chapter in the book is about my parents and how they had to move back to India when my mom got sick. Um, and a lot of that also fed into like, um, it made kind of made me who I am today, you know, as the sort of like pivotal moment in my life that separated my childhood or my, you know, uh, early years in, from, my, from my maturity. So I, I wanted to document that. And I, th and, um, I think Liz encouraged that a lot too. Mm -hmm. Um, these are also some early uh, excavations from my life in which I, you know, about going to college and then getting into Harvard for architecture school. And then also about my job, um, the sort of other pivotal moment, which, which was um, my, my job in architecture imploding and setting me off on this new path completely, right? Um, so you've seen some of this from my reading, which was the early, early years. Um, Another thing we also discussed uh, while doing the book, and as Liz mentioned, you know, we sort of shared a very, very similar taste in music. Um, and I think a lot of uh, the book is about my identity as not only as a trans person, but like um, as, as a goth, <laughs> let, let's say, and how like music informed a lot of like how, how I became who I became. And I think Liz appreciated that a lot. I don't know if you want to talk about the yeah. copyright business or not. I loved, I loved it. And I learned, I think that was the first book that we published that had, no, no, no. Actually, there was another one too that had, a lot of comics artists like, especially when they're doing um, memoir, they like to include songs because songs set the stage and songs are so important when, especially when you're talking about your teenage mm -hmm. years, right? So um I learned that we really can't include song lyrics unless we get the permission and we just decided to um, not go down that road. Um, so we changed it all to little musical notes like this, but you can mention the names of the bands. Right. You can even mention the um, name of the record or the name of the song. song yeah. um, so that was how, and then I can't remember how we got the idea, but, oh, right. the, yeah. but the, the title of the book, if you are a Susie and the Banshees fan, which we both are, um, is I, Spellbound. I, I do remember because I did another comic right. for another anthology called The Strumpet. And um, it's about coming out as trans. And then the last panel of the comic is me and two other people dancing in a nightclub. And uh, two, um, and the, the lyrics of the song are actually in that comic and it's yeah. Spellbound. By Susie the Banshees. Um, and I think you just glommed onto that as like, I don't know, you like that panel or something. And then you thought yeah. maybe there's a way to weave that in or to have that be the sort of um, I don't know. I think it brought the music more to the forefront when you when you thought yeah. when you wanted to re retitle it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And I think that I just immediately, you know, some titles just really click. Yeah. And that one just felt so good to me. I'm so mm -hmm. glad it felt that way to you because to me it felt like um I mean if you know the Susie and the Banshee song the lyrics are very appropriate for yeah. sort of the but also just the word itself mm -hmm. really can capture um this sort of um I don't know twist yeah. like intricate yeah the whirling world that we yeah. live in yeah. and 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 gender identity and how that manifests itself and I, I think yeah. it actually like informed me when I knew that this was the name of the book that informed me as I continued to write and draw the chapters that I needed to do to fill in the gaps or to flesh out the book. And I think it became something else entirely, you know, in, in addition to, um, you know, the characters that I'd established also, I, um, we invented or together we sort of came up with this third character, Titania, who's a trans woman 
who most explicitly sort of makes the connection between me as the author and Anjali as the my substitute in the sense that she's a sort of bridge between us and uh, and our narratives. So she shows up towards the end of the book, but in as is no less important, you know. Yep. Um, what are we doing? For, oh, it's eight forty-five. Wow. Um. I don't know if we have time for me to read the intro or not. Do you I don't know. To... Do we want to ask the leader? I'll, I'll jump in here and say, please take whatever time you would like. Okay. I myself could listen to you for another three hours, but don't <laughs> feel expected to do that. But thank you. Thank you. Okay. What we were going to have was Bishak was going to read the this. You'll see these pages are the intro, mm -hmm. right? And they look obviously different. Um, Bishak drew them in a, um, a sort of a duotone mm -hmm. type thing. It's not as technically a duotone for all you technical people out there, <laughs> but, it, but it has that duotone feeling. And um, I loved the fact that the intro and the outro are both done in this duotone, whereas the, the bulk mm -hmm. of the book is in full color, mm -hmm. which plays with your idea so that when people are reading the book, they can't say when they read the intro, oh, this is the real part. Mm -hmm. And the book is the unreal part. It, it makes you question what is real and what isn't real. Yeah. Um, so I'll read from this in a second, but I just wanted to mention um, <laughs> one, the one last thing about the book, which is that um, I think we both uh, uh, wanted to sort of end the book with a sort of uh, whimsical note. Um, so we came up with a recipe, or a, I came up with a recipe based on one of my dad's uh, writings about um, Bengali cooking. And we ended the book with, with this uh, comics recipe. I don't know if this, I don't even, there should be a book like this, like of just comics recipes, but um, this is a stab at it that ends the book. And I was so happy to see that someone on Instagram actually took to heart the instructions and made the recipe and they said it turned out really well. So <laughs> yay for comics recipes. Um, all right, I'm gonna share, uh, I'll just do one last reading for y'all um, of the introduction to the book so you can see how it's different from the rest of the book. So this is the introduction to the book, uh, which is kind of uh, backwards, but you'll see how, how like the process of doing the diary comic is different from how we approach the introduction. Oh, hey, I'm so psyched you could make it. I've never read this before. <laughs> um, oh well, you've read it, but not but, out loud. Uh, uh, what is it? Okay. Um, have a seat. Did you get the Rioja? It's so good, right? Totally tastes like dill. So I'm Bishak, the author and illustrator of the juicy volume you're holding in your hot little hands. And I wanted to clue you in as to what this book is all about. So in 2012, I quit my full-time job in architecture to take a stab at writing and drawing a graphic novel, a collection of short stories. I had been drawing comics most of my life but never thought I could do it seriously. When I eventually sent that first book to publishers and was waiting for responses, I began documenting my daily experiences. That's my cat, Hazel. <laughs> I'd been avoiding doing comics about myself on principle, but I figured, who knows, maybe it'll be therapeutic. Loath to draw myself, however, I substituted Anjali, a cisgendered Bengali American woman, in place of yours truly into these recollections. Sorry, I can't see the top half of this. Um, I realize in retrospect that I had resorted to the substitution for another reason, because, well, Mademoiselle Anjali, c'est moi, or at least she is who I thought I could be. To unravel that last claim, let me take you back a little ways in time. As a teen, desperate for some kind of identity to bring my blurry sense of self into focus and being something of a moody child anyway, I dove headfirst into the murky business of race yourselves, being a goth. I loved losing myself in black outfits, teasing my hair into a rat's nest supporting coal-rimmed eyes. Please cut your hair, Beta. You look like a girl. Needless to say, my parents were none too pleased with this unkempt, eccentric version of me. And my cohorts at college mistook my cultural identity for something else. Hey, you know what we used to call you on West Campus? Uh, no, what? 
walking aids. Aha. Uh -huh. But I, what was I supposed to do? I wasn't a gay boy, but I didn't feel quite straight either. Everyone else had their own little niches, the queers, the jocks, the deadheads, the nerds. I didn't even really jibe with a few other goths on campus. Where did I fit in? After grad school, I started to veer away from my goth trajectory. This is when I thought I should make a go of cultivating a career. I cut my hair into a sleek Vidal Sassoon bob and wore lots of J. Crew. Bishak is working at I.M. Pei's office. You know that designed the Louvre Museum? We are so proud of him. Oh, God. All of which pleased my parents no end. But as you'll soon find out, this arrangement didn't last very long. I was soon unmoored, alone, left to my own devices. That's when things started to change. Well, to say much more now might be overkill, but it was not so long after this that I started working on the comics you're about to read when I invented Anjali as a second identity, when the invention of Anjali started to mean something more. So let's leave it at that for the moment, shall we? I'll go get a glass of this, another glass of this excellent Rioja. You go ahead and dive in. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. That was such a, um, a tantalizing glimpse <laughs> that in the first five minutes of your presentation, I'm sorry if you saw me looking down, I was just furiously placing my order for my local bookshop, <laughs> Yay. Uh, which happens to be the Harvard bookshop. So Yay. Yay. a little meta. Love that place. Yeah, I bet you know it well. Um, uh, normally we open it up to questions. Um, so please feel free to unmute yourselves if you'd like to throw one out there. Oops, sorry. I had a question. Yes. Um, Jack, if you're willing to discuss a little more, I was hoping you might talk a little more about how Anjali kind of worked as an avatar for you as you started to come out and find who you really are. Sure, I like I mentioned, um, like most of Upsara Engine, uh, which I wrote before Spellbound and before I came out as trans, most of the characters in that are women, um, uh, cisgender women, as I mentioned, but like one story, which I wrote after I came out as trans is a trans woman and a non-binary person. Um, so having Anjali as an avatar at the beginning of this project, which I didn't even realize was a project when I started doing it, like I say, it, it was, it just seemed like a natural kind of um, strategy, you know, it's like, I don't want to draw myself. So I have this other character. She's Bengali American. She's an architect. She basically is me um, in all but appearance. Uh, and I mean, she, yeah, she's a little more softed than I am, but, uh, and, and she's, and she's cis, but of course at that time, I guess I didn't know if I was cis or not. So it was, I, I had no idea it was, but really the ramifications of it were, did not come into focus until much later. So I honestly, I hadn't, I never, I didn't give it that much thought in the beginning of this mm -hmm. exercise, which, you know, which I thought of as an exercise. Um, it was, it just seemed natural. It almost seemed like writing um, some of the characters from my fiction work, you know, except that she was playing me as a character. So I really didn't think about it too much, you know, and it's only, like I say, after the book came out and people started reading it and it, that it became much more tangled, mm. you know, and I, just a simple substitution at the beginning later on became so thorny in a way not in a bad way it just became more uh, much more kind of a multivalent like strategy than I had initially in, uh, envisaged uh, which is fine I mean it taught actually I guess it taught me a lot about myself you know and then when you actually had to draw the intro and outro mm -hmm. and you were drawing yourself as yourself yes. was that an interesting exercise for you because you were finally really drawing your physical self when Liz and I first talked about it, I was, I was, I didn't want to do it, honestly. Mm. Um, Cause I was like, oh, it's just going to like spell everything out. But of course it didn't, it just made, um, it just brought it into focus. Um, and then 
I don't know. I just, I, I, I just went with that and I was like, oh, fine, I'll draw myself. It's, just, you know, it's, I don't, I'm not sure. Maybe it reflected my, my kind of, um, not ambivalence, but uh, the, the sort of nebulous state I was in when I first started this book, when I hadn't come out and I still didn't know who I was. I didn't want to like fix that on paper. Yeah. And it, it only became fine. It, I, I thought it became acceptable to me to do that once I came out as trans and was more confident in who I was. So having my image on paper didn't become as fraught um, a, an idea as it might have been a couple of years before that. One thing I think is amazing in this case, and I've also seen it with other books that I've, other authors that I've worked with, is when um, the process of making the book <laughs> has an effect on the artists themselves. Yeah. Like we, I, that was something I hadn't thought about until I started working really closely with all these comic artists on their own memoirs. And it seems to come up over and over yeah. again that the writing of the memoir is therapeutic or is transformative in some sort of a way, um, partly because of the things that Shock has shared is that it's hard to pin yourself down to see yourself. You know, you're actually looking at things that were maybe really painful in your childhood, looking at your parents. Um, and I think that is like just another amazing reason that I feel so honored to publish this kind of book um, because it has that often has that kind of an effect on the author too. Oh, completely. And I'm sure that your book must be also transformative for people who are reading it. I would hope so. I mean, yeah, I've had people tell me, um, I've gotten, you know, great feedback on, um, particularly from people uh, from South Asia who or like from the South Asian diaspora who say that they've never seen representation of our kind, you know, representations of queer South Asians in comics before, queer and trans representation. So I'm happy to be, well, I was gonna say on the vanguard, but I'm not gonna get that highfalutin about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's nice to have that acknowledgement, you know, that, and then really a lot of why I do comics is just to have more representation of, of people like people like me in there, you know, cause who else is gonna do it? I have another question. I don't want to like. Oh, Sephora has a question. Yeah. Oh, Sephora. Yes. Hello. Oh, oh she's I muted. I think you're muted. I think you're muted. Oh, it doesn't look like she's muted. Yeah, that's weird. We can't hear you though. Yeah, we can't. No. no. Maybe you could type it into the chat or. I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. So yeah, it's a four. Type it in if you can, and we and I can maybe. Well, I don't need to read it out loud if it's in the chat, but we'll definitely get get your question. Yeah, we're not looking at the chat, are we? Yeah, I have it open. Okay. We want to hear from you. And then Whitney, you said you had something. I do. I, this is for Liz. Um, what are some lessons that you learned from doing this book that then you would do different later, right? So now that you've done 10 books, what are some lessons you've learned as a new publisher that you might change or grow from or do differently? Well, one, one lesson that I never learned, I was always trying to learn at when I was an art director and I still haven't totally, I'm always much more optimistic about how quickly we can get things done. And so I always plan to publish books up very optimistically thinking, oh yeah, you can get it done. And I, I didn't realize until I started really working exclusively pretty much on graphic novels, how long it takes to draw a graphic novel. And um, in the past, when I worked at Scholastic, I did a lot of work where I would have one author and a different illustrator. 
that goes quicker because the author can be refining and, and editing. And meanwhile, that the artist is doing their sketches. But if you have one person doing both of those things, there's only so much you can do in a day. And so I can't push. And, and when there's such personal stories to tell, um, I can't push people to do it faster than they can. Bishak happened to be like actually very uh, efficient and um, met all of her deadlines and all those things. But I, but I think um, I'm learning to allow more time for all the books, not and to sort of wait until they get to a different point before I announce it to the world. Mm -hmm. um, I like I get very excited about <laughs> that's part of who I am. I get very enthusiastic about any book as soon as I acquire it. Um, but I, I've learned to sort of be a little more judicious in, uh, how I let the sales reps know when I put it on the calendar. Um, and then of course, with the pandemic, like everything has gotten delayed. So I have to allow even more printing time. I was telling, um, Lisa and Whitney before you all arrived that, um, we print, most of our books in um, South Korea, because I really, as an art director, I wanted all of my books to be beautiful quality. Um, so they're they're beautifully bound. That most of them, like Bishak's book, have French flaps because I love French flaps. Um, we've even put in uh, end papers. Um, they're we usually use matte lamination, um, and we can't really afford spot UV and all those and embossing and things like that, but they have a beautiful feel to yeah. the hand. Um, they're printed on, I forget what pound paper, but pretty heavy paper so that there's no bleed through. Even with our black and white um, interiors, because there's just, the art is so detailed and beautiful. You don't want any bleed through. Um, so anyway, and as a small indie independent publisher with no big investors behind us, we don't have huge budgets. So I can't afford to print them in the US. Um, so we print them in South Korea. But now, especially with the pandemic, I've had to add even more time to uh, the printing and shipping uh, schedules. So those are things that I'm learning as I go but I don't think I'll ever stop being so enthusiastic. It's just who I am. <laughs> I feel like as someone who also designs graphic novels, I'm always trying to push people to allow the artists the time they need. And I'm always getting pushed back on that. So yeah. I sympathize with you on that one. Well, Whitney, I'm, I'm both sides of that. I know you're like telling people, yourself I'm the person that you push back against so I'm pushing back against myself because I'm like get it out I want this book out because I'm thinking about like cash flow and we haven't had any books published in the last two months and when what are we going to do and but at least you can reason with yourself because you are an art director it's much harder to reason with a publisher who's a marketing person no, that that's one thing that I love about being um, my own boss is that when things go wrong, I don't have anyone to yell at. No one's going to yell at me except for me. <laughs> so, so I spend some time sort of yelling at myself, and then I say, "No, it's okay. You can you can solve this. It's not the end of the world. It's not, you know, not open heart surgery here. Like if the books don't come out until a month later." it's going to be fine. No one's actually going to even notice. <laughs> so, um, it's, that's really refreshing because I, um, I worked for a lot of people over the years that were not as, uh, not as understanding about those kind of hiccups in the process. So we're, and we're just a very, it's a very human process. And, um, I'm involved in the editing of all of our books, although I hire an individual editor to work on each book because that's not my background. I'm, I'm an art director by trade. So in Bishak's case, um, Ada Price worked with us. Um, she's an amazing um, comics artist of her own in her own 
right? But she also is a teacher of mm -hmm. comics, right? <clears throat> yeah. And, uh, but I, I do a read through, I make notes on everything. I give it to the editor, they make notes. We combine our notes, then we give it to the author. There's a lot of um, collaboration, which is why we decided to talk about collaboration because it's, um, and then the same is true. You should actually have the editor and the designer here too to see whether they like this kind of collaboration. But with the design too, I have, that's my background, but I also know that I work better if I have someone else working with me. I'm more of an art director than a designer. So um, a, a colleague of mine, Cherise Silverman, worked on this cover with me. Um, I think I, Bishak, Bishak and I did the front cover, but then uh, Cherise helped like make the whole wrap around um, and then it wraps around the flap. Um, so I often have designers working with me, but they're all freelance and, uh, and hired for specifically for each project. If I, if I may um, read aloud the, um, the note that Sephora, the point Sephora was making, there's a great question. Bishak means without horn in Farsi. Do you relate to that? Without horn? Without horn, H as in humor. Do you relate to that? Oh. Very cheeky, Sephora. And then I can wow. I have to read my wow. final sentence, Without of course. Horn. Thank you for your wonderful you know that? presentation. I did not know that. Um, I'm, Fascinating. A, I'm, a, I'm a little- uh... I, see, I see another book. <laughs> I see another memoir. I do not in fact have a horn, no. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I don't, I'm not sure what to say. Bishak, by the way, Bishak is my dead name. Uh, which is to say it's my original, I haven't changed my name because I didn't think it would be, a, well, as far as like non-Bengalis go, I, I, it, when you first hear it as a person in the States, you kind of don't know what gender it is. So I just mm -hmm. stuck with it. I haven't really thought of what might be a more appropriate name and I, I don't really mind it. Um, it. I think it means several things in, in the, I mean, I. The Sanskrit and Indo-European roots of it, uh, I think, point to an etymology which is about spring. So I was born in April, and the, the month that resembles April the most in the Hindu calendar is called Boishak or Boisaki. And it's um, so I guess that's what my parents um, were thinking of when they when they named me that. Um, uh, but I'm not I'm not quite sure. I, what to say about the Farsi aspect. Of That's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, but thank you. For yeah, it seems like an interesting uh, echo of the layered forms of identity uh -huh. and self-image and how one sees oneself and how one can construct how others see you. And I don't know, it just seems like right. it's kind of an echo. I, I, I know like Bengali and Hindi have a lot of uh, overlap with Farsi, right? There's a lot of uh, words that we share in common, like bacha or hazar or things like this. Um, but I'm more I'm more uh, aware of the Sanskrit um, roots of, of. I mean, I'm trying to learn Hindi, and I and I think there's overlap. There's lots of overlap between Bengali and Hindi, but it's nice to know about you know the the Farsi aspect too. So um, thank you for that. Um, just so you know, som also uh, som means uh, moon and or sleep. So uh, one of my friends uh, from Harvard used to call me April Moon, uh, which was at the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's your Insta name. It's my Instagram. Instagram name. <laughs> if I could throw in a question, um, there were two particular moments where I uh, thought of your architectural training. One was um, looking at that spreadsheet, the sort of the map of the pagination. Oh, I had a side question on that. Was the final note, you know, actually it needs to be, I think it was 154 pages, um, Liz, that you would put in. Was that for even forms or more of a, like a, we need to hit a, a longer length so that it has a certain bulk? Or I was just curious about why. I don't remember. I don't remember. Yeah. 
exactly it's a, why. I'm sure it's not, not that not um, important, I think, but I do often, obviously, everything always has to be a signature, but um, I. That was probably what it was. I, I feel like a lot of times, not, not always, not, but sometimes um, I have to encourage my authors to write more, that they, mm. they start out. And this is part of what I was sort of trying to say at the beginning of what Street Noise does, what our role is in the world is we sort of work with authors who didn't really know that they had a book in them. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, now we often have people come, but especially in the early days when no one knew about us, I wasn't getting submissions from anybody. So I had to sort of seek people out. A friend of mine, when she heard that I was doing a graphic novel publishing company with focusing on the voices of marginalized people, she said, oh, you have to meet my friend Bashak. And so that's how, like, and another author I met because I flew out to Albuquerque, New Mexico to go to the Indigenous Comic Con. Um, and I met Jim Terry, who he had never, he didn't, have any idea that he wanted to write a memoir. Um, but I told him about Street Noise and I liked his art. As I said earlier, I always look at the art first and I said, oh, your art is beautiful. But I thought to myself, this guy is never gonna do a book for Street Noise because he does like um, horror comics and superhero comics. Um, but I told him about Street Noise anyway. And he, he sort of said very quietly, I've never told anyone this, but I'm thinking about writing a memoir. And I said, my eyes perked up and I said, well, I would definitely be interested. So, you know, here's my card. And then he wrote me an email and started to tell me about the kind of issues that he wanted to discuss in his book. Um, and I was blown away. And I said, this is amazing. Um, but there have been many things like that where I sort of met the person first, loved their art, and then said, can we create a book together? Mm -hmm. Sort of. Um, now it's sort of changing because Street Noise is getting, thank goodness, it's getting a, a good reputation. And so we are getting submissions from, from comics artists themselves and also sometimes from um, agents. And so I don't always have to do that sort of let's figure out how to make a book together kind of thing. But it turned out, I mean, Spellbound and Jim Terry's book, Come Home Indio, are two of our uh, most highly acclaimed books. They're the two books that were in the New York Times book review. Um, another book that got a lot of acclaim was another book that I sort of put together with the author, which was a Palestinian author named um, Mohammed Sabane. And his book is called Power Born of Dreams. And I met him because I happened to be on a trip to Israel and I wanted to meet Palestinian cartoonists. So I went to Ramallah and I met with him in a coffee shop and he showed me a wood uh, linoleum block print that he had done and I said would you ever do a book of these and he said oh, I don't really know I've never done he, he does political cartoons usually and he said I've never done anything like that and I said well I think if you want to try we can do it together mm -hmm. um, and that's an amazing book that came out in the fall called Power Born of Dreams so so I think that the collaboration aspect of it has resulted in some amazing books and I feel proud that, that I've had something to do with them existing in the world, that they might not have even existed yeah. had, had we not had, sure. met at that bar and yeah. had a glass of wine yeah. and talked about putting a book together. Mm -hmm. Right, which makes, I mean, the fact that your talk is literally about your collaboration, it's just all kind of full circle that that's how some art, you're like a combination of a of a maestro and a guardian angel or something. For, for artists. <laughs> wow. Uh -oh. <laughs> I mean, to have someone, I would think, to, I wouldn't know, I'm not a talented artist, but have somebody say, hey, would you like to do a book? And like somewhere deep down, you're like, you know, I've always kind of thought of doing a book, but I I can't believe this opportunity has landed in my lap. I think that's fairly unheard of um, and quite a gift to the world. Well, it's, it's really an honor. It's an honor. Yeah. Oh, my little question, if I might just take it back quickly, is I was curious if, um, if Bishak, if your architectural training, if you felt like the the like the formal training, I guess, of how how I don't really know what it is to do architectural drawings, but if it has, if you see any uh, overlap with 
how you render your, you know, comic kind of drawings. Yeah. And I thought of it not only with the spreadsheet, but one, I think it was the first panel of the outro, maybe mm -hmm. the one where, which was in the, the faux duotone. Yeah. And there was something about the, like the background, mm -hmm. there was like angle and I don't know, uh, shadow. And it just, it struck me as like a, a lovely rendering of a space. And then I remembered again, that's what, you know, you're trained to think about space in 3D right. and show it. So anyway, that I guess long way of asking, do you see any overlap? Yeah, absolutely. It's like, um, I mean, so a lot of the more experimental aspects of that overlap are in my first book, Upsar Engine, but certainly they show up in Spellbound. Um, I, I think the, my architectural training has allowed me to render interiors with some degree of fluency. Um, so even if they're, it, like, Apsara certainly has more like kind of phantasmagoric aspects to it, which are not in this book, but in this book, at least the environments that the characters inhabit have a degree of believability to them. Because mm -hmm. I think I, I, I've had some training in how to draw those kinds of spaces, but also I grew up at, um, you know, I came up in architecture school at a time when you had to draw by hand, as opposed to doing everything in CAD or Rhino or on the computer. So it, it dovetailed really nicely with my art comics practice, which is um, by hand, right? So I, I find it like very nourishing to be able to do that and to have those two aspects of my life overlap. I think a lot of it shows up in the, um, in the chapter in which I, uh, I go back to India and there's a lot of this stuff about mm -hmm. all of my like, drawings of airports and, and interiors of sort of liminal spaces and stuff. So I'm always interested in environments as an integral part of my comics. And I think uh, my training in architecture has allowed me to explore that with some degree of, of uh, facility. So yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. quite pleased with, with that outcome. And the hand lettering, which I, it was great to hear that that as I suspected when I first saw it, that it was all hand lettered. It was not, uh -huh. you know, a mechanical reproduction of say three variations of ease scattered uh -huh. throughout. It really looks it. And like you say, that hand and that feeling of, it completely dovetails with the fact that this is a very personal memoir. Anyway, the lettering also made me think of that distinctive style that you see in architectural mm -hmm. drawings, yes. but, but, but much, I mean, I know that's a specific style. It's like a vernacular a lettering vernacular and yours has it, but it's so personal and artful and unlike, I've never seen such beautiful writing and it's amazing how it's very readable, even though each letter has such personality. I feel like that alone could be, I don't know, you wouldn't sell your your lettering, but like that alone is, a, is its own form of like a, of an artistic rendering and skill. Thank you. I, so, I, I actually hadn't really thought good. about like, I mean, I also, as I mentioned, I, we did hand drawings in, in architecture school, which I, um, I don't think anyone does anymore, but we also had to hand letter our drawings. So, yeah. and that was a sort of skill and art all, all in and of itself. Right. And it's a very specific look. Um, right. I always kind of, I got bored with it, but I think it taught me a degree of, uh, gave me some kind of precision with, with letters that I then took into my comics. Um, I also took a lot of inspiration from uh, indie comics from the 90s and aughts where people were, and these are indie comics that you know, you know are handmade, even if they're published by big publishers or they don't have um, sort of typical comics fonts and they were all hand lettered, like Dan Klaus's work, for example, I think was a big influence on my lettering. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I still kind of, uh, I take a lot of pleasure in that aspect of comics making, you know, and so yeah. I'm able to do more fanciful stuff, but certainly for this, I was very happy that. Yeah, it adds such a, to do the and, and grace note. And it's funny when you were saying, uh, in, you were saying indie, I actually thought you were going to say indic, like indic scripts. Oh. Because I, I was thinking of a little, I don't know if you are able to to write in any indic scripts, but I was also thinking of some, I don't know them well, but some that I've seen with with a uh, somewhat uh, like 
sorry, I don't, I don't know the terms for mm. sort of like the curly, Q, forgive me, it's not a curly cue, yeah. but that there's sort of a certain yeah. look with terminals and loops that made me think of uh, maybe Telugu again. I know very I, little, I, do, I know nothing. I, but. I, I do write, I'm able to write in Bengali. Um, so, yeah. I, but I've never drawn a connection between that and, and my, or my hand lettering in English, but I think. Yeah, there, yeah maybe not. I, I, I might be trying to find a connection that's not there, but it just, no, I, it all I, seems I, like it's up a piece. I've always felt that about your hand lettering. Yeah. I've always felt that it had a little flavor of that. Uh-huh. I don't know. Like Lisa, I can't really describe why. why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just the lines, like the, the lines that sort of run through uh -huh. horizontally. Because they're, yeah, the index scripts do have the sort that of line, whatever it's called, the line that everything hangs off of. Yep. Right. The baseline. I, guess I kind of do when I hand letter, just because I have to have guidelines, which then determine the, the, the heights of each, the capital and the lower of case. So there is a sort of invisible line on which everything hangs. Yeah. And this is why these works take such a long time to do. I yeah. yep. This is just one example of what you're doing on every, in every frame. Yeah. Quite something. All right. I'm sorry. I feel like I've been talking too much. And <laughs> anybody else would like to, to, you know, <laughs> talk over me, <laughs> please do. <laughs> um, and if you guys want, if anybody wanted to put a hand up, that would be good. Cause I can't see the whole gallery at once. Otherwise, um, I also am mindful that we've taken so much of your time. Um, and I don't want to wear out our welcome or so to speak. So <laughs> Um, I have unless... maybe a concluding comment, which is that what I love about hearing you guys speak about your process and last month hearing Nora Krug talk about her process and what I think we're going to get from Alison Bechdel next month at the Dwiggins lecture is that every single graphic novel artist does it differently. And it's so wonderful to hear how many ways there are to pull together these wonderful books and mm -hmm. um, bring them to life and that there is no real standard. And that's kind of why there, it's such a beautiful art form to me because it is such a personal one to each artist. Yeah. And uh, I've heard Allison talk about her process before and it's so fascinating. And I know that um, if you do come to the Doyen's lecture, which I hope everybody does that, um, You'll, it's it'll be a treat because um, she's just a great speaker as well. So oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yes. you. This was thank such you, a thank you. wonderful opportunity. It was great to talk about collaboration. We yeah. have never done that before. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you you know, could take it on the road. Take it on the I was just going to say, exactly. take it on the road. Because it's very <laughs> inspiring too. It's, it's not only a joy to hear, but it also, it's, resource faith <laughs> people can work together and make something that's maybe even greater than the sum of its parts or something mm -hmm. i'm not sure what but yeah it's just fantastic thank you again everybody okay, for coming i you. will let let you all enjoy the rest of your evening okay all right and we're gonna, we're gonna open you. a bottle of wine yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh get the case get the case yep. you deserve it <laughs> all right all you'll right. hear from us soon Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. So Bye you everybody. Bye. Hi, Sephora. <laughs> Just Judith saying hello to you. Hi, Lance. Everyone else. Chris, hello. <laughs> Bye. Can't hear you, Sephora. Oh, maybe now. Turn up the sound. Did you say, can't hear you, sorry. <laughs> Great to see you. Bye, Chris, et cetera. Okay, 